Okay, so welcome to the lecture seven. Uh, so, so, so we, we, so last time we were looking at duality uh, and a proof of linear programming duality. And what we did was the following: we, we said that okay, suppose that we have a linear program in standard form, we transpose that x equal to b x non-negative, and if it has a finite optimum p star, so finite was important, this finite optimum p star doesn't, it's not unbounded below, then we showed using the Farkas lemma essentially that uh, that the dual uh, yeah, the dual will have uh, its uh, so its optimal value will be at, in fact equal to p star. So because we actually showed that it will be at least, it will be bigger than p star if we at least p star minus epsilon for every epsilon positive and we already knew from weak duality that p star is less than equal to p star. So together uh, we know. Together, uh, we therefore know that um, you know, that uh, p star will be equal to p star. So that was under the assumption that p star exists and uh, is finite. Under that assumption, we could uh, get that p star is also equal to p star. Okay. So so the question is yeah. So 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 then, so, so so the whole point was to characterize now uh, all the possibilities. So so one possibility is that if p star is finite, then p star is equal to p star. So what can, else can happen? So it might happen that what are the other possibility? The primer might not be feasible, or the primer might primer might be feasible and unbounded below. Like p star might be minus infinity. Like that to be a one way of putting it. So so your feasible x such that so for any number you can go make p star go below that number. Okay. Uh, so yeah. So the point is that if yeah. So so one thing that is sort of easy to see just maybe even from the weak duality proof. Is that if uh, uh, so? Yeah. So that is so. This is our first thing. The second thing is that if the primal is unbounded below, then the dual must be not feasible. Because if you look at the weak duality proof carefully, it says that every feasible solution of the dual has an objective value that is. Uh, less than or equal to the objective value of every feasible solution of the primal. But if the primal is unbound below, that means the dual cannot have a feasible solution. Then, the dual must be unbounded. It must be an infeasible. So uh, yeah, so and the same thing would also is the same kind of argument would also tell us that if the dual is unbounded above, then the primal must be. So the only thing that is remaining is actually the two things remaining. What if the dual is feasible and has a finite optimum? So the same kind of argument we did earlier. So we will also can show that if the dual, so if d star is finite, then also p star equal to d star. Essentially the same proof as above. So this I won't do, but you should as an exercise just check that this also is fine. So the remaining thing is the only thing is that the both both can be both primal and dual might be infeasible. These are the only possibilities. So so the possibilities are they're both feasible, in which case p star equal to d star, or they're both infeasible, or one is feasible, one is feasible unbounded and the other is infeasible. So these are the only possibilities uh, with duality. Mm So, so any, any questions about this?
So, uh, <coughs> yeah, so, so that was the, about duality. So now, uh, So now let's uh, look at applications. So the first application, so we saw was, uh, so we already said what it's going to be. So, so it was proving the one and one main max. So, so So, uh, so because of what was the what was the one and one min max theorem? So, uh, so yeah, it was so it was given like this. So the theorem was. So where uh, delta k is a, is a set of probability distributions. Over a finite. So that's, that's the theorem. So, uh, so any questions about uh, the theorem? So, it's, yeah. So, so, the, so, the, so the, the 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 interpretation was that R is a mixed strategy. So, interpretation. For the role play. So, uh, so, so who wants to minimize the payoff because the so, Uh, the, then R transpose A C is the expected payoff.
Okay. So well, there is a simplification that you can make. So there is so uh, so uh, so so yeah. So we we wrote like this, but there is a simpler form that we could state the theorem. Do do we do I have to write mixed strategies for both plates? So if one player has a mixed strategy, the other player need not have mixed strategy. So, so let me write that way. And let me see. If, you know. So, okay, so is this correct? How many people think this is not correct? Uh, can you raise hand? So, okay, so among those who think that it's correct, they should, one of them should be giving a proof. Uh, Isha, maybe? Just, I'm still trying to figure Sorry? it out. I'm, I'm trying, still trying to figure it out. <laughs> so let's look, just look at the left hand side. So I want to claim that this maximization over C can be replaced by just a maximization over unit vector. So why is that? So fix any R, what happens? So just look at the left hand side first. So we want to show that the left hand side is equal to the left hand side. So fix an R. Is it true that the inner, inner maximum? Is it, huh? it is it something to do with I mean when you're taking some probability distribution over the strategy, then it's a convex combination of the pairs? Well, but yeah, it's that, but it's also much simpler, right? So let's just think about this. So what is R transpose A? It's just a vector, right? Of what dimension? So what is the interpretation uh, of it's R? over R strategies. Huh? Over the set of strategies RS so the number of No, no, no. It's not over the set of strategies R S. It is over the set of strategies C has. So the interpretation of R transpose A is a vector of dimension N, right? Where N is the number of pure strategies C has. Such that the ith coordinate of R transpose A is exactly the payoff that would result if C were to play the strategy I, given that the row player has played a mixed strategy R. Right? And therefore, if the row column player, or, I mean, also because if the column player were to play a mixed strategy, then you have to take a convex combination. That is the same thing as taking R transpose A and uh, taking inner product with C. So that's R transpose AC. Okay. But yeah, as you said, so R trans, so the final this R transpose AC is some convex combination of the entries of R transpose A. So it cannot be more than for any C, it cannot be more than the maximum entry of R transpose A, which is what R transpose A E J maximized over all J is. So 
can someone now give me the argument of the second side like the right the left hand side and sorry the right hand side Actually, the same argument, same argument fixing yeah. C and yeah. So, so, so now, yeah. So now, yeah. So yeah, it's the same. So how would we do it? How do we, which vector do we look at now? We fix C uh, yeah. strategy of column player and then minimize over the drop. Uh, so now it's an m dimensional vector. Yeah. And uh, so ith entry denotes the row players yeah. payoff if he plays ith uh, mm. row. Yeah. So, uh, and the minimum over R in delta that will be so minimum over I will be at most minimum over R in delta. So minimum entry will be uh, the minimizing. The minimizing. Because there is always a probability distribution which is just putting the weight on the minimum entry that achieves that. And no probability distribution can do smaller than that because everything else is at least as big. And you are taking a convex component. Yeah, so that's so that's why there. So the left hand sides are equal and the right hand sides are equal. But this is a bit uh, concerning, right? Because why why can't we now do the argument one more time and just re remove the mixed strategies completely? Then we would be saying something which we know is false. But why can't we do this? So suppose yeah, so suppose it now is okay. Now we, yeah, oh, we can remove the mixed strategy and replace the pure strategy. Let's do it one more time. Now one player is already reduced to doing a pure strategy. Let's change the second player's thing to also to a pure strategy. And then we would be seeing it even for pure strategy one by one min-max theorem holds. But our whole starting point of this uh, journey was to start with an example which showed that that doesn't that is false. So what goes wrong? So we just show that left hand side of both are equal, right hand side of both are equal, but the above yeah. equality doesn't hold for. Yeah, that is fine. But now maybe, yeah, maybe we can try to do it, do this one more time and try to write a third line here, where in the third line we take start the second line and prove that the left hand side of the third, second line is equal to the left side of the third line. But the left hand side of the third line is going to be the same, except that in, you know, the minimum over R is replaced by minimum over just the entry. Or one less one is less than equal to i less than equal to m. So can we do that? So the question is 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 this equal to you can this be uh, So it was very uh, we were very successful removing mixed strategies for one pair. Can can you know, just be uh, my sorry? So probably so in some cases not always. Yes, in some cases, yes. So, so, so the very first thing that we did fail, so at least the same strategy will not work because there the whole thing was to fix the outer max optimization and then look at the inner one. Now there's nothing outer, there's the inner maximizer and somehow now we have to argue that that one will be correct even if we change the R by T and that is not clear. Like, we're not in the conversation. So yeah, so this in general, the same strategy will work and you can show that that will be false. So this won't work. And I mean, it's good, right? Otherwise, there will be a contradiction. Yeah. But yeah, but I, yeah, I'll, I'll ask you to just go over the argument we need to replace the inner optimization and see why it doesn't work with the outer one. Okay. So, uh, good. So, yeah, so this is what we we'll prove because now they are equivalent. If you prove this is equal, then this is also true because these both sides should are equal. So, any, any questions about that? So this is an important reduction because this will be useful. So, so, so and it's also useful in applications. So if you have any questions at this point, you should like I can wait for a minute and you can uh, ask.
So, uh, okay, if there are no questions, uh, let's proceed with this. So, okay, so now we want to prove this uh, equality. So, how will you prove that? So, let me give this thing in. So, the first hint that will prove star. Okay, so uh, yeah, so uh, what can we do? Is there something, some different form we can write the left hand side of star in? So, like this is like we want to be uh, choosing, so we want to choose some R such that summation R is equal. Like equal to one, and uh, we want to do this minimization. So, yeah, and this we are going to minimize over R, but what is being maximized is what is being minimized is some weird function, it's not a linear function, mm -hmm. it's yeah. A maximum of a bunch of linear yeah. So Maybe we, we can write this as minimize some z such that the inner quantity is less than equal to z. So, yes, yeah, so, 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 so the claim is that the left hand side. of star is equivalent to, yeah, so what we're saying? Minimize Z. Minimize Z. Yeah. Such that uh, R transpose A, uh, Jth entry of this is less than Z for yeah. all. Yeah, yeah. So, so R transpose A, the Jth entry is less than equal to Z for every uh, one. M cross M. Yeah. And what else? Is R there any is on the simplex. R is on M. Yeah, R is on the property simplex. So what does that mean? So R, so there is R i is which are so uh, so it goes from one to M, which is equal to one. And is there anything else? Greater than equal to zero. Yeah, they're all normal. And this also is a linear constraint. R transpose AJ is just uh, so let me just write it like this. The J entry, which is just nothing but R I A I J I goes from one to one. So now this is actually certainly looking like a what we must what we would call a linear program, right? I mean every constraint is linear, and you are optimizing a linear function, so just one variable. It's not in the standard form. No, right. I mean, we had a standard form for linear programs, right? And it is not in that form. So what was our form? So, so our form for linear programs used to be that all the constraints. So what was it? Uh, so it was like this. It used to be like min. So standard form was minimum of C transpose X uh, with some other matrix we call it B. Uh, M, mx equals b x non negative something like this so here we have an equality constraint first of all and uh, so on uh, so what do we do so okay but, but what do we want to do at this point so we want to use linear programming to and see what the dual looks like, just to see what the dual looks like so here's a prime it's a it's a it's equivalent so first of all yeah so yeah, let me just go a bit slow so this is a linear program. The first claim that is actually equivalent to the optimization on the left hand side of star. Is that clear to you? So the, my claim is that when you solve this program, you will get an R, which will actually be solving this problem, which will be the minimizing R of the left hand side here. Is that clear to everyone? And the optimum value will give the optimum value of this. So let's check that first. Okay. So that's it's, it's a bit it's simple, but it's just let's just check that. So, so okay, so there are two things to check, right? So first thing is that the object of the uh, the objective. So firstly, let's check that any R that that is. So let's take take the optimal. Uh, so 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 just I'll just check it. So so suppose uh, R star is the optimal optim optimal R uh, for the left hand side of star. 
then then just taking z to be they were taking r to be equal to r star and z to be equal to min one is less than j f k n r star transpose a uh, with j f n uh, is is a feasible solution. Solution to the LP. So this is called the LP one. LP one with the same optimal value, same objective value. So, so the oh, Z max of over J or min over J? Sorry. Z is max over J or? Uh, no, it's min, right? So yeah, uh, so. Of course, you take max and z, z will always be taken to be infinity. So the, the, the min is important. So you take trying to find okay. the smallest j, the z, so that every uh, entry is, is smaller than that. So the smallest z will exactly be equal to the. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. There is a max. Z should be max. Yeah, yeah so, so, so this whole thing should be this. Yeah. Yeah. So the yeah. So the whole yeah. So this will be max. Yeah, so again, so if it was less than equal to then the max would become unpaired. But we were so inner problem was maximized. Right? So so we want a z which is less than or equal to everything, and you want and if we take the maximum such z that will actually be equal to uh, wait again. I have messed up something. Yeah, no, no, no. That's why that was correct. What, what was the it? LP was correct, yeah, the but LP the Z value correct. which we want, yeah, 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 we yeah. should take max. Yeah. Min. yeah, right. Yes, it's yes. the value of Z was the max. Yeah. So yes. So the yes. The point is that the Z you want to take the Z that will satisfy that the smallest Z that will satisfy that every entry is less than equal to that is just the maximum of the issue. Right? So that everything bigger than that will be satisfied, and anything smaller than that does not satisfy because the maximum entry will conflict. So. Yeah. So 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 yeah. So so this at least one direction is clear. So the objective value of this program is not going to be uh, bigger than the objective value of the um, actual of the left hand side of star. The optimal value of left hand side of star. So this is what this shows. Right? That the opt of LHS of star. Um, is bigger than or equal to the opt of LP1. But now if I take, yeah, but the same argument works in reverse also. I take an optimal solution of the LP1, take that R and take the Z, take the Z. then I have like, uh, yeah, so then the Z will of course have to be the maximum of, uh, but yeah, in, you know, in, no. Let R L P be optimal. R uh, uh, R L P Z L P be the optimal solution for L P one. And then. Uh, then we see that uh, then then we see that that then we see that the z is just uh, then z l p is equal to uh, what it is equal to the max of r l p one is less than so that we get. That uh, we get that uh, opt of LHS of star is less than equal to ZLP, right? Which is equal to opt LP. So combining these two, we get that. Sometimes it might be slightly trickier to just see that the linear, the optimization problem you're seeing is actually a linear program. So things that might not look linear can be made linear sometimes by just introducing a few extra variables. 
So you, you should always be on the lookout for these things. So for example, as an exercise, uh, here is the problem. So you know what the L1 ball is, right? So, so just, so exercise. Um, I mean, we'll come to that later. Once we have done this Okay, so so far we've just, yeah, so all we've done is that we've taken an LP and we've shown that it's the correct thing. So now, uh, yeah, so we want to use duality. So we want to just see what the dual of this LP is. But this LP is not in the standard form. So there are many things we could do. We could just put it in the standard form and then take the dual. So what does putting it in the standard form mean? That means that we should get an LP which has the same objective value, maybe a few extra variables. And somehow that the solution of this LP can be read off from the solution of that LP. So that's what converting it into a different form would mean. Or we could actually generalize our duality thing to this setting also. Both things work in exactly the same way. Uh, just now, uh, let me just use the thing of moving it into the standard form. You will see exactly what is happening and very quickly you will learn. Yeah, so with some practice, you learn exactly how to take the dual even if when things are not in standard form. The crucial point is that uh, that's basically so what happens. So, so when we're taking duals, any equality we could multiply by any number, but any inequality we can only multiply by non-negative numbers, right? Because the whole point of taking a dual is so combine these equal constraints in such a way that the combination is also a valid constraint, and then compare it with the object. So, uh, so that that roughly is the the uh, the rule of thumb that you, you, the dual is a combination of the original constraints. And the way you have to combine the constraints is such a way that the, whatever con new constraints that you are generating, they all should be valid. They should be valid. They should be, or not, they should be the consequences of the original constraints. And to do that, uh, equality constraints can you multiply by real numbers, but the things that you multiply the non negative constraints, the inequality constraints right, should be non negative. So, so we'll see what it means, but uh, instead of doing it that way, let me just. Uh, uh, make everything uh, like this just to see that it's just to show how this can be done. So one simple way to do this is that so Z there, there is no constant of Z that Z is, has to be non-negative and so on. So what you do, yeah. So what you do for such variables is just express them as differences of two non-negative variables. Okay. So so what we do, so. We take duals by converting to standard form. So this is yeah. So to standard form. So so the so yeah. So the uh, yeah. So the so uh, the whole goal is usually you would not do this, but usually you would uh, instead uh, jump to the dual directly with some practice. Point is the dual is supposed to. So this is the thing to remember. So that it's supposed to represent valid linear combinations. So sort of uh, all necessary, all necessarily. Implied linear combinations. Yeah, but for right right now, what we do is the following: we uh, we. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so, so what to convert uh, to convert inequality constraints to equality constraints, we just introduce slack variables. So as you see what those are. So we introduce slack variables. To convert 
unrestricted variables to remove unrestricted variables by unrestricted i mean that those which are not restricted to be non negative we express them as as differences of no differences of uh, non negative variables Okay, so what what is so how will this show up? So, so for us, what we'll do is so replace z by uh, v1 minus v2, where both v1 and v2 are non-negative, and introduce a slack variable. So there are these inequalities, right? Which these ones, which are the problematic ones. So we introduce a slack variable for each of them. So slack variable is j non-negative for each one less than j less than. And we write the following LP. So what is the new LP? Min v1 minus v2 because that is supposed to be z. Summation one is less than i less than m r i a i j. Uh, so this minus z was supposed to be less than equal to zero, right? So we write that as minus v1 plus v2. So that is like z plus s j is equal to zero. So s j is the slack variable. Okay, and now all the variables appearing are non-negative. Oh, sorry, by the way, one more. All the RIs, all the SJs. So now we are in the standard form. So this is the thing to check. This is let me call this LP one bar. So claim is, and this is that LP one bar and LP. Are equivalent in the sense that they have the same optimal value, and given a solution of LP one star, well, LP one bar, um, LP one prime, I can get a solution of LP just reading it off. Uh, like what will I do? I, I'll set my z to be equal to v one minus v. That's it, and all the other constraints will be satisfied. So when we transform LPs, you have to remember you have to remember to prove this that the two LPs are equivalent in this sense. Objective values are same or at least related in the sense that from one you can get the other, and you can read off the uh, optimal solution of of the previous one from the new one. So in this case, they're really equivalent. You are like you don't need the full equivalence. You just need to go from one to the other, like the LP one prime to LP. But here they are. You can go from in both ways. But now you can take dual because now it's in the standard format. Okay, so so yes. Yeah, so what is the strategy for taking dual? We have to have one variable each for each of the non like the uh, each constraint that is not of one of these non-negative constraints. We have one variable. Uh, so so let me just write that dual down, and uh, so so it look like this. So. So remember that the objective of the dual, what it used to do, is to have it. it will, so so I'll have the dual variables. So let me put the dual variables. So the dual variables. 
So the dual variable for this I will call u, and the dual variable for this I will call y j. Um, so let's just let's just uh, see what our dual stuff used to look like. Or rather, let me see. maybe. So here is what our duals used to look like. So. Uh, Yes, the dual used to be maximum b transpose y, a transpose y less than equal to c, without any constraints on y. Okay. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's fine. Um, except that uh, what was what was the what was a a was the full constraint matrix. The primal was c transpose x, a is equal to b x, not negative. Right. So that's. So now, basically, what this means is that you have to, yeah. So what what you do is you multiply the each constraint and then compare it with the coefficient in the objective. So that's how. So the dual now. So the dual is. Yeah. So first, the objective value is just u, right? It's max. Max u. Because all the other, all the other, uh, the, the the right hand side of the equality. So on the left hand side, everything has to be linear, not a fine linear function of the variables. Here the constant term is zero, so only this one is not zero. So you get just u. And uh, yeah, and now let's start comparing coefficients. So let's compare the coefficient of um, ui ri. So for each variable to compare coefficient. So Let's compare the coefficient for uh, um, for uh, R i. Uh, so that we get uh, that uh, u plus. So you will get u plus. Um, uh, yeah. So what is this? So a i j by j summation a i j by j. J goes goes from one to m, right? Uh, and here it's zero, right? So we get that this has to be less than equal to zero. So this is compare. This is for each r. This is for each r i. So there are these m constraints. Okay. What are the other variables? There's the variable v one, right? The variable v one appears in. Each of these constraints only, and also appears here. So for this one, we get that. Uh, uh, yeah. So so let we'll see what it means. So we'll say that summation y i minus y i um, is equal to one. Where again j sorry. And similarly for v two, we get that um, summation. Y j j goes from one to n is not less than, less than equal to is less than equal to minus one okay, by comparing coefficient of v two. Now we compare coefficient of s j. There are n of them, and each one appears in just one, and there its coefficient is y j. So we get so y j is less than equal to zero. One. So this is the dual. Okay. So now let's do some surgery on this. So firstly, let's replace all the y j by minus y j, right? Just to make things fine. So if I just do that, uh, my things become. So let me just or rather write the variables minus y j. Uh, so then this will be a minus sign here. This will be a this. This will be minus, and this will become y j. But look at these two inequalities. What are they saying? J equal to one. Sorry. Summation by J is equal to one. 
Yes. So they, they are together saying that this is actually equal to one. And this is not a coincidence. The reason why did this happen? This happened because these inequalities were dealing with a variable z that was unrestricted. So you will find that with unrestricted variables, the corresponding constraint in the dual would be an equality constraint. So that is that is one of the other uh, rules of thumb. I mean, it's not hard to write as a theorem, but you keep doing it and you realize that this is what happens. Okay. Uh, yeah. So so. Good so far. Uh, yeah. And we can also write this in a slightly different way. So this becomes like this is bigger than equal to u. Okay. So now we have max u, summation j equal to 1 to n, aij yj bigger than equal to u, summation j equal to 1 and yj 1, y bigger than equal to 0. Now let me do one more. Cosmetic thing. Let me just change the names of the dual variable to C. Okay. And yes, of course. Okay. Now, do you see something? What is the dual? That's exactly the RHS. Yes, it is exactly the RHS. By the same argument we did earlier. So, which is the same? Which Same as uh, so this u is basically going to be the optimizing u is going to the minimum of the aij. So the whole thing becomes max over c in delta n uh, min one is less than five is less than m of ei transpose c. So we are done using LP duality, except there's one thing left. Uh, so remember the duality theorem had conditions. It's, it had these conditions that uh, P star equal to D star, provided that they are both, I mean, both the primal and the dual are feasible, right? But in this case, they are feasible. Uh, so yeah, so it's, it's a check that feasible and bound. Check that in this case. So actually, you just need to check for primal. Primal is feasible and bounded. Bounded so that so that p star equal g star holds. So, so, that's, so this is something you have to check. It's actually pretty easy because the, uh, yeah, uh, I, mean, I mean, both the fragment bounded, unproduced bounded and feasible, they're both easy. Uh, probability distributions exist basically, and, and because A is a finite matrix. So it's easy to check. Um, but um, yeah, so any other questions about the whole proof? So it was more or less. Straightforward. I mean, you just wrote the primal, you got the dual, and that's it. That, that was all. So you have to do some massaging on the dual, but that's it. So, uh, any any questions uh, so far? If not, we'll do another application from complexity theory. So, okay, so, so, so does everyone know what a circuit is, a Boolean circuit? Like, how many people do not know what a Boolean circuit is? Can you raise hand in the... Okay. Okay, uh, yeah, sorry. 
the starting time. So yeah, uh, yeah uh, okay. So okay. So let's uh, do. So, um, so Boolean circuit is just, uh, yeah, so Boolean circuit. Uh, so actually, I, for the thing I'm going to do today, it wouldn't matter whether it's circuit. So you can just think of it as a program. So, so uh, yeah, yeah, so Boolean circuit. Uh, so I'll write something, but you can just think of it as a program that takes as input a string and output is a zero or one. Okay. So Boolean circuit is the, uh, is a directory cyclic graph. With nodes labeled by either yeah. either uh, an arithmetic of either a Boolean operation. Uh, well, the place I clicked up with a unique, uh, with a unique uh, sync node. Yes, cyclic. Sorry? There's a typo You've written cyclic. Yeah. <laughs> and not labeled by either a Boolean operation, which is. Usually, yeah, just the set and or not, or as an input node. Okay. Its operation is that uh, its operation is that when all the input, so first you assign a bit to each input node. Each node, each each every other node, all all non-input nodes compute their label function of the values of their parents recursively. So bit value. So if you want to assign this, no, assign this to be there. Right? And the output of the circuit is the find the is the value to be there. Yeah, so don't worry about this. Uh, it will be relevant only next class, probably. That's exact form. Uh, for now, all you can think of it as it's a. So it's like a. It, so it's a explicit description of a program that takes as input a collection of bits and outputs one bit. So, so, so circuit is so circuit is a. Is an explicit. Given. Function that on input x from zero one to n, n is the number of input nodes. So the size of the size size of the circuit is the number of edges. Okay. So one so one of the fundamental problems in complexity theory is 
that uh, is uh, that given some non explicitly given function so given just some function by its truth table what is the smallest circuit that computes that function and in particular for different classes of functions what are the smallest classes of circuits um, that would uh, what is the smallest circuit that would compute uh, compute that function so so yeah so so as you can imagine the one of, one of the objects of study so one of the objects of study in complexity theory is uh, so an important so sort of uh, yeah so 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 uh, like basically yeah, so so one yeah so with the one quantity question for example is finding functions right so yeah find is so i put quotes about things where like there's an important thing is find functions f uh, mapping 0 1 1 which cannot be computed so each of the quoted words requires some formalization by small so so this is yeah, in some sense yeah, i think say that this is probably the fundamental problem or the few fundamental problems of complex theory circuit computer theory find so find doesn't find the function so correlated to that we want to understand how well circuit to on certain functions okay. so one measure of how good a circuit is doing on computing so okay so how when do i say that a circuit computes a function so if on every input x it agrees with the function but maybe that's too hard let's say that we will say that a circuit is roughly computing a function if one say 1 minus delta fraction of the inputs it's doing well okay so so one one figure one possible figure of merit so so let, let uh, so let c be a class of circuits which could be just circuits of a given size okay be a class of circuits maybe all circuits of size to the size and uh, yeah so so we could say for example that uh, so one um, so a function uh, so set of circuits on n bits so let me say um, so uh, on n input bits so the number of input bits is so a function f is said to be delta hard for c so what is this function f where is it from it's from 0 1 to the n to c if uh, uh, if the probability when x is chosen uniformly from 0 1 to the n so the only the input is being chosen randomly cx is equal to fx is less than 1 minus delta for every c okay. so so instead of writing it this way there will be some we will write it slightly differently so we'll define something called advantage so so we define uh, at one. So this is yeah, by the way, this terminology is between uh, I think between Pavi as well. I mean, it isn't, so the, it's not like the terminology is very uh, innovative, uh, but the result is also between Pavi and Pavi. This is the one that, the, or rather the lemma that we prove about it in Pavi. So, 
um, yeah so yeah so so what we use is we can write this in terms of advantage which is which is turn out to be a little bit easier can write this in terms of advantage so what is the advantage the advantage of a circuit c on x is defined to be one if cx is equal to fx and zero uh, minus one if cx is not equal to fx. Okay. The advantage of uh, uh, of a circuit C on S is defined to be all x in S advantage. So the so yeah so the so the del so yeah so so function x is delta hard for c for every c in c in script c uh, advantage of c on the full set is. Uh, So for every set S and every C, I have this notion of advantage, how much advantage that the C have on C. Okay. So the question in Pagias are suppose the function is, suppose somehow that there is a function that is hard uh, in this sense, this delta hard. His question was, are there small sets, like much smaller size sets, on which uh, for uh, yeah. So, okay. So, so there will be two classes now. So, these are okay. Suppose that a function is delta hard for some uh, slightly larger class. We'll mean we'll say what that means than C script C. Is it the case that for the smaller class, somehow even there will be some small sets on which the function is really hard in the sense that the advantage is close to zero or zero times the set set. So actually, or maybe instead of I will not follow. Um, I will not follow Alain uh, Pagliazzo uh, and, and define this to be like this. Then size goes down. Okay. Yeah, so, so, so the question that Alain Pagliazzo asks is like, can you, from given that the function is hard, can you find small sets? On, so hard in the sense that its advantage is less than two delta on. Okay. Uh, on, on uh, Wait, what do you like? Sorry, sorry. Um, the advantage is less than one minus two. Yeah. yeah, so people didn't catch it first. So the question that is, so there is a one minus two, this right here. Right. Question in Pagas asked is suppose the function is delta hard like this. Can you find small sets for which the function is really, really hard in the sense that the advantage is close to zero? The order. So, uh, so that's what uh, you would have. So, the impact is impact is this question, and the proof that we'll have or the, whatever we'll do is sort of in a sum. Impact uh, question uh, is if f is delta hard for, for uh, c prime. Uh, is a really, really hard advantage close to zero on small sets. So not for the full set, but in the small on small sets, or perhaps some slightly smaller plus. Some slightly smaller plus. What do you mean by small sets? I mean, 
Yeah, so a small set. Yeah, so the point is that we probably don't expect it to be hard on like a full set two to the upsize two to the n, but we would want like the size. Yeah, so on on maybe on maybe I should should say smaller sets. So what we the size of these sets should be of the order two to the n times delta. So we'll, we'll look at this question via method that um, appears in the Pavlov's paper, is but is attributed to Nissan. So, so, he, so here is what we start doing. Okay, so we'll start in the sort of the opposite way. So we say that suppose um, the following happens. So suppose that. So, so I write something and then we will think about this later. Um, yeah. So suppose that uh, that there is a um, So, so uh, uh, yes. Yeah, so what we'll do is this following. So, so let uh, script D be the set of probability distributions over sets of so subsets of size exactly. So let me assume the delta is has the corresponding is like like uh, the delta times to the n is an integer. So it's exactly to, to the n of so the so it's a property distribution over subsets. So it's like each element of the sample space is a subset of size related to the delta times to the n. So 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 it's a set of all such probability distributions. Okay. And uh, suppose so suppose that we have the following that the minimum over all distributions in this times the max uh, over the maximum over all circuits C the expectation. When S is chosen according to B, yeah, sorry, not script D, but C of A C S is uh, is greater than or equal to epsilon. So this is an assumption. So what is this assumption saying? This is saying that if suppose that no matter what distribution you choose over uh, in particular, it also works for every single set. But even if you choose a distribution over small sets, as when you fix the distribution, there is some circuit such that it's expected advantage when S is chosen according to that distribution on that S is at least epsilon. Okay, so this is like the opposite of either the second part of the question. Suppose that there is that it's it's it so happens that our class script C is such that no matter what distribution we choose over small size subsets, these sets of size like these roughly slightly small size subsets, data times no matter what distribution we choose over them, the expected advantage of, of some C, so like the best C, if I take the best C, then the expected advantage of that C is at least epsilon. And what is the expected advantage? I first choose S at random and then look at the advantage of A over. Right, of C over there. Okay. So suppose that this is true. What can we do immediately after this? Is there something that we have just seen that allows us to conclude something non trivial out of this? Hmm. 
does this look like something we have just seen like maybe half an hour ago the left hand side looks like this payoff yeah it is in fact the left hand side of the von neumann minimax theorem and what is that it is that there are two players the set player who has to he has to play a uh, set s of, of size delta times to the n and the circuit player has to play um, a circuit c in script c uh, and wants to maximize the pair Maximize payoff, and the payoff is, and the payoff is A C S when the the circuit player plays C and the row player plays S, and this is exactly it's a, it's a, they are playing pure strategies. This is exactly the game, and this thing here, the star, is exactly the left hand side when. The script is a set of mixed strategies for the set play, right? And so, uh, so by applying to so note that the set player has finite number of strategies and circuit player also has finite number of strategies. We are not doing anything infinite, anything, anything in infinite. So everything is exactly in the setting that we see. Exactly the LHS of the Binet theorem. And thus we get that mm, that there is that there is a distribution that there is a distribution over distribution. So I'm just writing the right hand side now, gamma over c, such that min over all sets. So yes, such so that uh, the you know, the what so so that the expectation when C is played from gamma of A C S is greater than zero. So this is just translating the right hand side of the min max theorem into this language. Okay. This is interesting. Now, what this thing is now is a distribution of circuits such that no matter what is for every edge, so that for every so that no matter what s, there's no distribution over s anymore. No matter what s the set player chooses, the advantage of c when c is chosen at random, the expected advantage of c over that s is at least epsilon. Notice that the weak duality thing would not have been sufficient for this because the weak duality just says that the left hand side is at least as much as the right hand side. And here we all only have a lower bound on the left hand side, so and we also want to have a lower bound on the right hand side. So the equality is important. The strong duality was important. Weak duality is not sufficient. So check that weak duality would not be sufficient for this. So uh, good. So okay. So this is interesting, but what can we do with it? So so let's yeah. So let's uh, yeah. So let's look at something. So so let let me if so so let's see what what this one can give us. So it, yeah. So so because remember it's true for every s. Okay, for every s of size. 
So let so fix so now now so let alpha be between zero and one and uh, define um, s prime to be uh, those excess such that uh, such that uh, the So the expected um, in C is sampled according to gamma is uh, is less than alpha. Epsilon. My question is, how big can this S prime be? Can it be? Can be? Can it be bigger than delta times two to the n? Can it be of size delta times two to the n? So suppose that s prime was of size at least delta times two to the n. Is, is there a problem? The above thing, if the above assumption was true, then that would be a problem, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so we are already, already, always uh, one. We are always working in the assumption star. So, assumption star implied that the expectation that are expected at one page of 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 c when c is chosen at random over any set s of size delta times two to the n is at least epsilon. Now, if I have that S prime instead of all those excess where the advantage of expected advantage of C is less than alpha epsilon, you can check by linear expectation that this just adds, this just like, yeah, so the expected advantage over such an S prime will also be at most alpha epsilon. And so, I'll, so if S prime was bigger than delta times 2 to the n, then you could just take a subset of delta times, delta times 2 to the n of S prime, and that will be a contradiction to. Uh, one, so this certainly means so from one. This means that s prime is certainly less than to the times two to the n. But in fact, we can get something slightly more quantitative because okay, it's less than to the times two to the n. So we fill up, we fill up uh, whatever is uh, left with some arbitrary excess, okay. And so we want to see how much bigger can it be, and uh, so what we get out of that. So uh, yeah, so um, so in fact, let now so now we have just, when we have shown this, let G uh, be a subset of size of G uh, of uh, subset of size. Uh, Delta times two n such that g is superset of s prime. Right. Then uh, yeah. So then what then what do we have? So then we have that epsilon is so the expected is, is bigger. Right? So it's less than equal to the expectation of. By definition, right? Now these days, all of them might as well be zero, but these guys will be contributing at least uh, alpha times epsilon, right? So like, so at least alpha. So this whole thing is bigger than one over delta times two to the n. So this guy can contribute zero, right? Or in fact, even minus one. So this can contribute minus one. Um, Uh, okay, I think I'm getting somewhere. 
So this will be like minus. Uh, yeah, I think I might have missed or something. So, so this will be like minus s prime. So this could be as bad as minus one because I don't. We have no bounds on this. Um, but these ones uh, are. At least alpha times epsilon. Okay. So this is like alpha epsilon. Um, minus s prime. One plus alpha epsilon divided by delta times two to the n. Oh wait, sorry. Um, not give that. Let's go less. Than. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, so less. Than. So less. Than. So okay. Um, yeah, so I want less. So, 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 yeah, so, so everything in S prime can contribute at most alpha times epsilon. So that's why we're getting worried. So, alpha times epsilon times the size of S prime. These guys can contribute even one. I don't know anything about them. So, there, there I can only say this much. So, now with this, I get that this is less than uh, one um, minus one minus alpha epsilon times S prime over delta. Right. So uh, the option of all of this is that s prime, the size of s prime, is less than delta times two to the n. So after rearranging things, um, times uh, one minus epsilon by one minus alpha epsilon. Okay. So uh, so assume now assume that uh, yeah for less than one half. So then this is less than um, delta times 2 to the n by 2 minus alpha. Assuming epsilon. Okay. So this actually it's not just less than delta over, it's almost half that set. Right? So the set of those guys which are less than alpha epsilon. Their size is quite small, so it's certainly less than two times two to the n. It actually less than two times two to the n times two minus over two minus alpha. Okay, so uh, yeah, so maybe yeah, yeah, I think what's going on now will be like, so yeah. So we we'll finish this next thing, but so let's just recall recall what all we have. So we started off with an assumption that so we are already on good on nice on on a good enough track. So what have we done? We started off with the assumption that no matter what distribution over small sets of size delta over 2 to the n you take, there is some circuit which achieves a good advantage. And by good, I mean at least epsilon advantage. Out of this, we have a, been able to say that there is a distribution over circuits such that a set of those set, set of those x elements on which this circuit family has a small advantage is actually small. On everything outside this set, this circuit family has pretty high advantage, like at least alpha epsilon. So now, if I just took some majority kind of version of this circuit family, I could boost the advantage that it has, has outside this small set S prime. And therefore, I could get that if the this circuit family was having some little bit advantage over all small sets, this function f could not be delta hat. So that's the goal. Uh, that we want to prove, and then basically we are mostly done with it. We, uh, the rest is just Chernobyl. So we, uh, we'll do that next time. It's already our time. So, okay. so any questions? Yeah. Yeah.
ఓకే ఐ జస్ట్ వాంటెడ్ టు యాడ్ అ కమెంట్ సో ఇంపాక్ట్ గ్లాస్ ఇన్ ఇస్ హ్యూజ్ యా సో ఇంపాక్ట్ గ్లాస్ ఐ జస్ట్ వాంటెడ్ టు యాడ్ అ కమెంట్ అబౌట్ బికాస్ ఇంపాక్ట్ గ్లాస్ ఇన్ ఒరిజినల్ పేపర్ గేవ్ టు ప్రూఫ్స్ ఆఫ్ దిస్ థియరమ్ యా దిస్ వన్ ఇస్ ట్రూ దిస్ ప్రూఫ్ దిస్ ప్రూఫ్ ఇస్ దిసాన్స్ యా ప్రూఫ్ ఇస్ ఎస్ ఎస్ దిసాన్స్ మెథడ్ దిసాన్స్ మెథడ్ యా అండ్ వి విల్ యాక్చువల్లీ సీ ది అదర్ ప్రూఫ్ ఆల్సో లేటర్ ఆన్ ఇన్ ద కోర్ యా it will be a slightly more constructive proof mm-hmm. and mm-hmm.